I'm actually a recovering geneticist. I, I was a, a graduated, you know, with a PhD in, in conservation genetics. Worked on it for a number of years, but have switched over the past 10 years and have been working primarily on restoring Atlantic salmon to, to Lake Champlain. And I'm presenting here um, the work from a PhD student at Purdue University in Mark Christie's lab, uh, who has come up with some really novel ways of being able to look at adaptive genetic variation in Atlantic salmon. And I'm going today to try to explain some of that research to the best of my ability, and then also relate it uh, to some of our management actions that we're, that we're trying to do based, based on those results. So what did we hear about this morning? We heard about ad adaptive genetic variation. Why is that important? Well, it's important because we want to understand you know, if and how species can adapt to a rapidly changing environment. And that's really the goal of conservation biology. And the way we try to get at that is through adaptive genetic variation. And some of the questions that we have when we're trying to look at adaptive genetic variation that have been very elusive are what genes are needed to respond to whatever selection event is there. And then also, is there enough adaptive genetic variation to respond to selection caused by some of these human-induced forces that are happening at a really fast rate? Climate change, invasive species, you know, these sorts of things. And then finally, we're going to try to employ some new tools that have been developed to uh, look at adaptive genetic variation and specifically use this experimental transcriptomics, which is looking at uh, messenger RNA or gene expression and uh, to help answer some of these questions. So what's the issue that we're talking about today? That's this rapid selection event that's happening on Atlantic salmon in Lake Champlain. Well, it's this introduction of a non-native species that's causing a vitamin B1 uh, deficiency or thiamine deficiency. This was observed early on here in New York State, Cayuga Lake Syndrome with, with lake trout and so forth. Many people in this room have heard about this, know a lot about this, and it's been observed in a number of different salmonids uh, within the Finger Lakes, within the Great Lakes, within Lake Ontario. There's been very high mortality seen on some species through time. 2003, alewives show up in Lake Champlain, and we start to see this issue uh, popping up with the Atlantic salmon in 2005. What is the cause of, of thiamine deficiency? Well, it's uh, an enzyme thiaminase that breaks down the essential vitamin B1, thiamine, um, into the forms that you see here, such that they're no longer able to be utilized in the metabolic pathways um, necessary for a number of different functions that I'll, I'll talk about in just a little bit. Well, how does salmon, how do salmon come in contact with thiaminase? Well, the thought is, is that um, alewife uh, contain an enzyme, that enzyme, within some of the bacteria within their gut. And so essentially when salmon feed on these non-native alewife, they have this bacteria that's then in their gut that then has this thiaminase ability, digest the vitamin B and so forth. So where does vitamin B come from? Well, it's a trophic transfer process into the forage fish and that the salmon eat, and then the salmon utilize it as a, that essential vitamin because they can't produce it on their own um, in order to uh, have the energy production through the various metabolic pathways. They then allocate it to their eggs, and then it's consumed within the eggs by the fry during the developmental process. But if there's insufficient B1 for successful um, reproduction or even energy uh, production, then it's going to decrease that B1 allocation into the eggs, and you're going to end up with insufficient vitamin B for normal development of the fry. So what are some of the issues that we see? Th these are some Lake Champlain fry, unfed fry that are, are showing some of the abnormalities that I'm talking about. So there are these neurological abnormalities, visual abnormalities, and um, <coughs> basically energy production abnormalities associated with this type of behavior caused by vitamin B deficiency. You can actually rescue these fish by giving them a bath in, in vitamin B and their behavior.
behavior within hours can, can become normal again. It's pretty striking. There are other physical signs. You can see some of the hemorrhaging that's occurring um, within the yolk sac on this individual. These are all signs that we saw in the fish that we studied as, as part of this experiment in Lake Champlain. In addition, the, the ecological impacts are this rebu um, reduced visual acuity as well for the salmon. So not only can they not find prey as well, you know, but they also are more vulnerable as, as well to, to predation and so forth. And then decreased energy production in terms of being able to make these migrations back you know, to the spawning grounds, especially if they're challenging areas like Cascades. So in Lake Champlain, Atlantic salmon were extirpated in, in around 1840, and there's been an ongoing reintroduction effort since coordinated in the lake since the 1970s. And since alewife have been reintroduced and these signs of vitamin D deficiency have been seen within the hatcheries, they've prophylactically treated all of the eggs of fish, the feral fish coming back. So the idea was because we do have this short-term solution of being able to treat the eggs to overcome the mortality event, um, that was the band-aid that was being used over and over again, you know, associated with this. And the, and the question uh, that we started to address is if it's possible for salmon to be able to, is there enough adaptive genetic variation there, right? You know, to be able to respond to this selective pressure and is the best thing to do to prophylactically treat or should we allow for selection to occur in the hatchery to potentially develop a higher tolerance to low thymine? So the way we did this is we simply took uh, pairs, nine families from a single year, we crossed those and then we split their eggs in half. And then half of the eggs received a, a vitamin B treatment and the other half did not received the vitamin B treatment, <coughs> just a water bath. And then those uh, egg thymine levels were then determined through HPLC analysis. So here's the design of the transcriptomics uh, uh, analysis of looking at the F, these F1 individuals. So basically what we did is we looked at the gene expression of four full sieves from each of those groups. So two individuals from the treated part of the family that was split apart, treated with vitamin D, and two full, you know, and another set of full sieves from, you know, the untreated. And we asked, what's, what's the gene expression of those, of those groups? Is it different between those that were treated and untreated? And then we, in addition, looked at survival over time of each of those families, both treated and untreated. And that survivorship difference among the families, was that correlated in any way with gene expression to really allow us to get at what genes were truly adapted? So I'll show you the results from the first part. And we did find untreated families without the vitamin D treatment are indicated in the red. And the yellow triangles are those replicates of the families that were, were treated. So there are two individuals from each and you can sort of see, you know, through time here on a PCA, how those full sieves, you know, a replicate from each of the groups show differential gene expression um, uh, for this, for well over um, 700 genes. So the next thing we did is, is we looked at what's called, uh, I have to, co-expression network analysis. And this is the idea of, of trying to look overall at the genes in concert with one another to see what functional units they had for those that were differentially expressed. And we found three different areas that those grouped into. And I'll just show you the one for neurological function but there is also a group for metabolic and, and cardi cardiac components. So this is the network analysis that was done. And if you zoom in on that, it shows that differentially expressed genes actually had pathways that were associated with um, the need for vitamin B cofactors for enzyme function. And that primarily in this case was for, for neurological development. So the genes that were differentially expressed 
many of them lined up with the traits that you might expect from low thiamine. In addition, we looked at their survival analysis, and this is where we just simply took uh, the relative survival of individuals compared to the most, um, the, the family with the highest survival. So we took those hazard ratio values and we plotted those in a regression against the mortality, or that mortality rate then against the gene expression. And so basically it was risk of death versus gene expression. Wondering which genes were upregulated for higher survival or upregulated associated with, with higher mortality. And so essentially what we found was those that were upregulated and, and also caused higher mortality were those associated with physiological stress. There are 812 genes that did that. And then those that were associated with lower mortality um, when they were increased in expression were with growth and development. There were 634 genes associated with that. So basically, this is what allowed us to identify a set, those sets of putatively um, adaptive genes that were different um, among the families that give us an idea that there is adaptive genetic variation that's there. So in that common environment, that pattern of gene expression across the families um, allows us to believe that there is genetic, adaptive genetic variation there that can respond to selection and that allows us to think about changing around the way that we will work in the future with development of the brood stocks. And so my final slide here is just to say that we have, in concert with this, developed two different brood stocks. One brood stock uh, was with the surviving families that were not treated with vitamin B, and the other brood stock is with the families that, or the portion of the eggs that were treated with vitamin B. So the founders, we had 104 families, I'm sorry, 114 families. 104 survived with vitamin B over the years that we established the brood stock, while only 49 families um, survived without treatment. So we're going to move through time in Lake Champlain and look at their relative survival um, and performance of those to determine if, if indeed we can develop a thymin, uh, low thymine tolerant brood stock. So with that, to make sure I have time for a couple questions. I'd just like to acknowledge all of the um, contributors to this research and then let folks know that the, this has recently been published in the journal Molecular Ecology if you want to find out more details on the genetics. And you can email April with specific questions about genetics and I'm happy to take questions about the, the management rootstock and try the genetic uh, questions the best that I can.